Okay, look. 2022 sucked for movies. But 2022 still had great movies to talk about. Pick 20 that you absolutely love, that you kept smiling at. Talk about that and nothing else. Don't rant about what was shitty about the year. Don't rant about why it was, sh why it was so shitty. Just talk about the movies you love, okay? What's going on, guys? I'm Tyler, and there is no perfect movie. But in this video, I'm going to be counting down my top 20 favorite movies of 2022. So, without hesitation, let's get started. And a fair reminder to anyone who disapproves of the selections on my list, if there's a movie you guys love that's not on this list, there are a couple different reasons. I either didn't like it as much as you, or not at all. And, yeah, life's tough that way. Deal with it. So, let's get started. The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent was a loving tribute-slash-satire of Nicolas Cage, his acting style, and the very unique fan base that he has. It's nice to see Cage actually laugh at himself and just embrace the call following that he has, and he's the rare actor playing himself who doesn't feel like a cheap wink at the camera. He's genuinely taking his role seriously, and he has pitch-perfect chemistry with Pedro Pascal, who is so lovable and charming as the biggest Cage fanboy in the world. The Cursed revolves around a French village in the 1800s being stalked by the presence of a werewolf. And rather than rely on cheap jump scares or false alarms, the movie actually takes its time to build up tension with its dreary atmosphere, simultaneously beautiful yet disturbing camera work that knows how to make the werewolf look, look much more sinister when it's off screen. There's this original mythos surrounding the werewolf and the set of rules that goes along with this curse that I had never seen before and it came with some wicked as hell practical effects. There's an autopsy sequence that had me shaking for a solid 5-10 minutes when it was over. That alone made it one of the scariest movies of the year. Raymond and Ray has the story, characters, and themes of much better movies that came before it, but it's the minor subtle details for Rodrigo Garcia's script, direction, and the two lead performances that help you identify with the pain these brothers are going through. Ewan McGregor and Ethan Hawke especially have terrific chemistry as brothers, and they add a lot of subtle layers giving some of their most nuanced performances ever by making the straight-laced stick-in-the-mud and aimless womanizer tropes feel a lot more refreshing and human, where the straight-laced stick-in-the-mud can be equally profane and prone to fits of anger in comparison to his brother, while the aimless womanizer who is so bluntly honest about everything actually freezes and can barely bring himself to tell the cold hard truth about his dad's passing, not because he wants to be polite, but because it's just too hard for him, something he wasn't even expecting. And Hawk even has one of the best romances of the year with Sophie Okanedo. It's a movie that tries to be more emotional than original, and in the end, that's what I got out of it. A lot of people are going to kill me for even acknowledging that this is a good movie, let alone putting it on a best of the year list, but the fact that a fucking Daily Wire original movie has zero political messaging compared to Hollywood is a miracle in and of itself, and I genuinely mean that. Shun In is just your average home invasion thriller, the Hyperions is a Wes Anderson superhero movie, not much else, and Terror on the Prairie just wants to be a fun western. And as a fun western, I had an absolute blast with this. I love that the cinematography throws back to Sergio Leone era movies where the cinematography just captures so many gorgeous ultra wide shots of the beautiful Montana countrysides, making it very vast and empty and also making it very clear that when our main characters are in trouble, there is nowhere to run, which is very fitting because this is a home invasion thriller that happens to take place in the Old West. The fact that there's no music even adds to this agoraphobic atmosphere and makes every sound effect, every gunshot feel all the more intense. The shootout sequences had me pumping my fists every single time. And believe it or not, Gina Carano proves that she can give a genuinely good performance without relying on her fists. This was a pretty good year for werewolves, huh? I mean, I should know. I'm not entirely sure why this wasn't at the very least a 90-minute Disney Plus movie, though, because Michael Giacchino in his directorial debut proves he absolutely could have done it by making something 
truly brand new for Marvel. In this case, the suspenseful and exciting tribute to Golden Age monster movies filmed in gorgeous black and white, very stylish gothic sets, lots of practical makeup and exhilarating action sequences with very elaborate fight choreography and some of the goriest kills in Marvel history that actually rank up with Multiverse of Madness or at the very least a Marvel Netflix show. Laura Donnelly kind of overshadows the werewolf a little too much, and I could go on and on about the reasons why, but as is, she still gives a good performance, and Gael Garcia Bernal still stands on his own well enough as this refreshing, new, likable hero that I hope we see more of in the future. Like any Martin McDonough flick, The Banshees of Inishirin is so dark and goes from comedy to tragedy within an instant you're never sure whether or not you're supposed to laugh or feel bad about what's going on, but what you do know for sure is that it is hilarious and tragic and goes between these two tones seamlessly. Colin Farrell, Brendan Gleeson, and Carrie Condon shift between these tones without skipping a beat, portraying characters who, at the very end of the day, are pathetic losers who are so stubborn they either refuse to change the negative aspects about them or are willing to give up the progress that they are making just to spite other people. But even when you laugh at them for it, you still root for them because at the very end of the day, they're capable of being compassionate. They're capable of taking charge of their own lives. And the movie presents a story where they are forced to use what little time they have left in order to do what makes them happy, what makes them better as people, and what makes their lives fulfilling. I couldn't guess where this story was going or what was really happening in the background until the villain revealed his plan halfway through, and that's a rare accomplishment for any movie these days. The menu gets everything right about the culinary industry and wisely satirizes everyone involved, whether you're a pretentious chef who thinks everything you make is genius and anyone who doesn't like your food is a douchebag with no taste, or a spoiled, ungrateful customer who doesn't realize what hard work goes into making a fucking salad. Believe me, I know. And the violence is not only creatively shocking, but it's also symbolic of the frustrations that come with the restaurant business. Ray Fiennes and Anya Taylor-Joy's back-and-forth banter is equally funny, thrilling, and thoughtful. Hong Chao is basically living out a waiter's darkest fantasies, and again, I know that for a fact. And Nicholas Holt is so fun to hate as your stereotypically obsessed foodie who gets one of the toughest blows I've seen all year. After a 16-year absence, Todd Field's comeback may in fact be the best set of his free movies, and Kate Blanchett disappears into the role of Lydia Tarr, making the rare feat of getting you to root for someone you know for a fact is a scumbag, and you feel disgusted whenever she abuses her power, but at the same time... When she has to be the smartest, most talented person in the room, she proves her knowledge, work ethic, and passion towards music that makes you genuinely respect her and actually feel bad when her life starts falling apart. And the themes surrounding cancel culture, the way Field addresses it, raises so many questions about why is any accusation, true or false, instantly believed without question? Are all canceled people irredeemable, and why are they all on the same level of being disgusting? These are themes that Field has done in previous movies before, but I think we can all agree Tar is a movie we desperately needed right now, and this is just a great movie about being able to separate the art from the artist, and also acknowledging that people can in fact change and repent from their sins as long as they're remorseful, willing to actually change for the better, and if they're given the chance to do so. Probably the most controversial pick on this list, but I stand by my original thoughts on Blonde and my surprisingly popular video, which I gotta say is some of the most fun I've ever had making a video. Ana de Armas gives the hardest performance I've ever seen and maybe the most impactful. She perfectly embodies the public persona of Marilyn Monroe, along with what life behind the camera might have been for her. Bobby Cannavale, Adrian Brody, and Xavier Samuel all give standout supporting performances as the loved ones in her life, for better or worse, and Andrew Dominic's insanely stylish direction that makes psychological drama turn into psychological horror is still so fascinating to think about. I don't know 
to this day still what half of it means, but it's a style I've never seen before in a movie and something I want more of. And altogether, Blonde is the rare biopic that A, knows it's bullshit, and B, tells a life story visually as much as it does verbally. And again, more movies like this, please. 3,000 Years of Longing reminded me of movies like Forrest Gump, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, or The Fall, where the emotional hook of the film centers around the story set within the movie and what it has to say about the storytellers themselves. Idris Elba as the Jinn was incredible, and George Miller makes the Jinn stories a visual feast to see on the big screen. Admittedly, some of the effects can be worse than RRR in terms of maybe being a tad unfinished, but just like RRR, the imagination that goes into it led to so many stunning visuals that you just don't even care. Miller once again creates a massive scope with amazing sets, colorful costumes, gorgeous cinematography, an epic musical score, and the talented side actors in the flashbacks are so good at making you care for people who barely say a word, disappear within five minutes, and yet they leave just as big an impact as Idris Elba and Tilda Swinton. Not an easy thing to accomplish, but they accomplished it in spades. Years after his Oscar win, Mark Rylance is just on a roll and is probably one of my new favorite actors working today. He makes the character of English one of my favorite characters of the entire year, portraying him as cunning, methodical, manipulative, but still charming, mysterious, and sympathetic. The side cast ranging from Zoe Deutsch, Dylan O'Brien giving his absolute best work ever, and Johnny Flynn, who is the one mobster that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe in mind games with English, they all rose to the occasion. And the fact that the story is contained in one location, all of these mob-connected people are keeping secrets from one another, made for an extremely suspenseful thriller. If you've never heard of Rock This Town before, there's a very specific reason for that. It only played in one theater in one city, and once it disappeared, we may never even get a glimpse of it again. And Rock This Town is a documentary about the history of my hometown Kitchener Waterloo's rock music scene, and it's hard to believe that it all started back in the 60s to 70s when an engineering student who was so bored by the lack of extracurricular activity at his university, he asked 499 classmates for a dime each so they could rent out a gym for a dance. And then they had to invite the nursing department by making it three ladies night because 498 of the 499 students, they all had sausages. And years later, not only did the Guess Who write American Woman in our hometown, you're welcome for that, not only was Kitchener-Waterloo the North American debut of fucking Elton John, but this engineering student got a second career as a booking agent and was so good at his job that at a house party he threw, the band was Super Tramp. And people didn't even notice! Which is insane, like Super Tramp was still a big deal back then and there are so many stories that I can go on and on about and that's the great thing, the anecdotes were the reason to check out Rock This Town. They all feed into this uplifting message about the togetherness and experience that live music can have on people. A message where... It's just such a great fucking documentary, and I really hope that the theatrical experience at the Princess Cinema in Waterloo is not the last time we see it, because it deserved a hell of a lot more. I was breathing so hard and so fast during the finale, I legit thought I was having a panic attack. And that never happens, but I'm glad it did with this one. Even Hawk scared the shit out of me as the grabber. And a lot of that comes down to the mystery surrounding his character. Why does he target kids? What do his masks mean? What's he actually going to end up doing to Finny? And if the ghosts on the other line of the phone calling Finny died trying, is their advice even going to work at all? It's the rare movie that actually knows how to mix supernatural and psychological horror, and Scott Derrickson builds up a lot of cla claustrophobic tension with very few jump scares and maybe one false alarm, if at all. Not to mention getting some of the strongest child performances of the entire year with Mason Fames, Madeline McGraw, two actors I really hope we see more of soon. So, um... 
Before I saw Jackass Forever on opening night, the most knowledge I had about them was the night before when I watched the original movie on my phone on Netflix. And then a day later, as I was watching the Silence of the Lambs skit, 10 minutes in, that was the hardest I had ever laughed in years. And from then on, I instantly became a Jackass fan. I love the new cast members, especially Zach Holmes and... I feel fucking stupid saying it. Poopies. I was going to say McInerney, which is his actual last name, and plus it sounds like a really cool last name. But um, yeah, love the new cast members. The original crew managed to prove they've still got it despite their age showing in parts. The stunts are just as creative and refreshing as ever. And fucking Danger Aaron, man, like, you got to get out of this. Like, go over to the Food Network. Like, you'll still be the punching bag of the network, but I mean, you'll get a lot more tasting and less teasing. Now look, the first three times I saw Multiverse of Madness, I had an absolute blast. I thought it was the best Marvel movie I had seen since Endgame, and you know what? I still stand by that, but the script that everybody was complaining about, it always had problems. The pacing was always off, Chavez's presence kept disappearing during very vital moments, and um, yeah, Reed Richards is not the smartest person alive, everybody got that part right, but... The moments in this movie that were awesome, like the Mi the Mike Wazowski monster and his eye operation, the reflection sequence when Scarlet Witch invades Carmitage, all the destruction that comes with it, the Illuminati massacre, Doctor Strange basically possessing his own corpse and riding deadites as if they were wings. Along with all of Sam Raimi's incredibly kooky camera tricks where there are lots of Dutch angles, quick zoom-ins, all of his Evil Dead tracking shots, Books of the Damned, fighting with evil versions of himself, made for probably the biggest guilty pleasure of the year, and a movie that was so refreshing for Marvel that was not your standard superhero action drama, but more of an action horror movie that is just on the verge of being R-rated. Cumbernuts, in my opinion, does his best work as Doctor Strange, showing much more vulnerability towards the character. Uh, Elizabeth Olsen improves significantly as Scarlet Witch and kind of, sort of, makes me forgive her for what a waste of time WandaVision was, even though she goes for the exact same plot, except darker and with a few more consequences. A few. Altogether, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness was just fun. Now, I saw Pearl before X and really had a good time with it. And then when I saw X, it didn't do anything for me. I just thought it was another generic slasher. But regardless, Pearl was absolutely insane. I love the Golden Age Technicolor style that director Ty West creates through the old school scene transitions, the musical score that is so orchestral. Being able to make daylight as scary, if not scarier, than nighttime just goes to show the versatility that Ty West has as a director and shows his passion for movies of any era, whether they're horror or not. Mia Goff was excellent as Pearl, and the fact that she co-wrote this movie goes to show how much passion and interest she has towards the character and turns her from this naive, innocent farm girl to this sexually repressed, resentful sociopath. I wouldn't be surprised if she was the one who wrote that big monologue everybody loves because... It was clear as day that she made such a scripted moment that had to be nailed in one take feel so natural. Regardless, the credit really goes to her, and I can't wait to see Maxine. Even when a scene repeats itself or goes on for too long, the Northman never has a dull moment. Robert Eggers commands your attention towards each scene that's filled with trippy, intense visuals, very rich Shakespearean-level dialogue that is ex it's as exciting to listen to as every battle scene is to watch, and it's so theatrical that only the best actors who perfectly fit the role could pull off. In this case, Alexander Skarsgård, who is perfectly cast as Amleth, Nicole Kidman, surprisingly Oscar-worthy in this out-of-the-box against type role as the villain, and plenty of side actors like Anya Taylor-Joy, Willem Dafoe, Ethan Hawke, and even Bjork, who make a huge impression with very little screen time. 
I howled and battle cried along with the other Vikings as they were just ripping each other to shreds. That actually made each fight scene a lot more intense. The fight choreography was insanely brutal. The musical score was big and bombastic with the, with the constant climactic sound of drums. And the cinematography featuring so many long takes that were meticulously staged to perfection. I really wish that RRR actually came to theaters in my area. Otherwise, when I saw Brad Jones's review, I would have instantly gone to the theater. RRR was the biggest surprise of the year. I really need to sit down and binge SS Rajamuli. Sorry if I got that wrong. I really got to binge SS's other movies because it proves the strengths of Indian, Indian cinema to so many people by showing the universal entertainment value they have where... Within the same scene, it can go back and forth from an action thriller to a musical, a buddy comedy, a family drama, and a war epic all at once, and it actually feels natural. The stunts and action choreography are beyond imaginative, and just out of this world with the physics of a Fast and Furious movie, very shoddy visual effects, but like I said with 3,000 Years of Longing, the imagination just is more than worth it. It has R-rated violence that I have never seen before with a lot of insanely brutal kills, and a story that has developed characters, committed acting, complex themes, and emotional depth that most Hollywood blockbusters just don't have anymore. Again, emphasis on most. Well, speaking of, Top Gun Maverick is a movie that you could watch on repeat, and the flight sequences alone will be just as exhilarating and jaw-dropping every single time. The fact that these are real fighter jets and pilots doing these insane stunts, incredibly dangerous stunts that take months of preparation to pull off, months that the actors trained alongside in order to get everything right and feel like they're authentic pilots, riding in the planes to make everything feel all the more real. The way the cameras are rigged so that the audience feels like they're in the cockpit every time the... Every time the jet just turns and everything cuts back and forth between multiple planes makes you feel like you're on a 4D roller coaster. And in between all of this gorgeous spectacle that is filmed beautifully on IMAX, there's still an emotional story that stands on its own in comparison to the original. And in many cases, it's significantly better than the original. And there are plenty of simple and identifiable characters to root for in between. Tom Cruise gives maybe his best work yet. It's great to see Miles Teller in another movie. Glenn Powell is so much fun at making you laugh along with the bully, and as much as I complained about her before, the relationship between Cruz and Jennifer Connelly got significantly better over time and felt like a more authentic and integral romance. Everybody keeps saying this about Maverick, but it's absolutely true. This is how you do a legacy sequel. This is how you do a popcorn blockbuster. This is how you do a movie. And there is only one other movie this year that I can honestly say brought more spectacle, brought more emotional depth, brought more excitement, and just all the more fun to sit in a theater all three times I went to see it. My number one movie is... Robert Pattinson, Zoe Kravitz, Paul Dano, Colin Farrell, John Turturro, Jeffrey Wright, Andy Serkis, Peter Sarsgaard, Matt Reeves, Greg Frazier, Michael Giacchino all deserve equal credit in making the Batman the best Batman movie I've ever seen and one of the greatest comic book movies I've ever seen. The Batman feels more like a Hitchcockian thriller with lots of beautifully staged film noir cinematography and lighting that portray Batman as a detective first, a crime fighter second, and as opposed to your average fast-paced superhero drama, this really takes its time to explore the investigative process that Batman has, skipping the double life drama that we've seen countless times to the point where Bruce Wayne barely shows up at all. The fact that this movie goes two and a half hours without even referring to Batman as Batman. I love that the story focuses a hell of a lot more on what Batman means to Gotham and to Bruce, how much he spends time punishing the guilty over protecting the innocent, and which one really matters more to him. Zoe Kravitz was seductive as hell, badass, and morally conflicted all at once. Paul Dano 
cartoony moments aside was fucking chilling as the Riddler. The action scenes were a lot of fun to watch. The car chase between Batman and Penguin alone, that was worth the price of admission. And there are so many details I can go on and on about that make the Batman the most fun I've had in a theater all year. The best movie of 2022, in my opinion. Guys, thank you so much, as always, for plowing through with my best of the year list. Let me know in the comments below what your favorite movies of the year were. Be sure to stay tuned for more videos in the new year, and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.